<laughs> um, so it says, maybe you've been handed the narrative of nationalism, which puts value on only the lives and children born inside your border. Waging peace means we erase the lines that tell us whose children are worthy to survive and whose children are disposable. Maybe you feel a particular joy or security at having been born in the right country, um, into the right religion, and on the right side of history. I was there too. I sang, proud to be an American, on the 4th of July, pounding my feet into the Iraqi sand, bursting with pride. I felt like I loved America more than anybody else that day, because I had boots on the ground and a weapon strapped to my hip. But instead of serving those who gathered under the American flag, my pride used my service to co-opt the flag, to make it more mine than yours. I believed my religion held more weight and my politics were more valid than yours. Veterans should never use their service to make themselves greater than the people they serve. I'm embarrassed that I found myself there for a long time. I find parts of myself standing in so many of these places and perspectives. It took a war to shatter the singular lens of us versus them. It took meeting the people I had been told were my enemy in war in order to value those I had been told were my enemy back here at home where I lived. Before the war, I viewed the world through lenses obscured by false patriotism, white supremacy, and a self-centered religion. I didn't even know I was wearing these glasses or seeing the world through them until I went to war and saw my beliefs and actions. Bullets and bombs cleared my ears to the still soft voice of God, but I love them, Diana. I love them too. It took being faced with the choice of whether to take a child's life to make me able to surrender to the undeniable call to love my enemies. That was the first time I felt pulled between what God was asking of me and what my country required of me. God wasn't calling out my bad theology. God was confronting my unlove. But I never imagined that the real test would come when I returned home. How would love respond to the divides in my neighborhood or the violence that took the lives of Tamir Rice, Trevon Martin, Michael Brown, and so many others? What could love say to the fear and the demonizing that infected every news headline, painting the sky with us versus them ultimatums? Could love stand up to the vandalism and bombings of black churches, mosques, and Jewish cemeteries? What could love say to the white supremacist rally in Charlottesville and the white nationalists recruiting in my city? Could waging peace respond to the voices of my scared, and marginalize black, brown, indigenous, and Muslim neighbors? Could it answer my own son's question? Did you, did you know you were bringing me into a racist country when you adopted me? If choosing to love first and wage peace can change enemies into friends on the battlefield of Iraq, I know that it can right here in our own neighborhoods, churches and families who are battling over politics, religion, migrants at the border, and who really belongs in America. Love is the foundation I'm planning my feet squarely on. I had no control over what the Iraq war would ask of me. The only thing I could decide was how I would show up for it, what I would do and what I wouldn't do. And in that decision, I found what was worth dying for and what was worth living for, to love. Love is what I'm arming my sons with to go out in an angry and hurting world. This is the truest gift I can give them, an arrow to load in their bow and a solid bullseye to aim at. It's a posture to live from and to love from. It's the power to decide ahead of time how they will show up for their neighbor nobody likes and how they'll respond to the bully on the playground or to the violence and uncertainty this world is going to ambush them with. I can't guarantee that choosing to love their friends and their enemies isn't gonna cost them, but I can tell them that there is no greater freedom than refusing to harm another person. And that is a freedom worth fighting for. Freedom isn't free, no matter what country we are born into. The amount of violence against another human being we are willing to accept is a litmus test for our own freedom. 
We can measure our unlove by the distance we put between ourselves and the violence done to others. The currency of unlove is dealt in indifference. Free people are able to give their lives away, give the advantage away, or put another safer concern above their own. That's true freedom. Fear tells us to insulate ourselves from others. Ignorance convinces us to ignore others and their problems. Self-righteousness tempts us to create us versus them lines, keeping all the truth and the goodness on our side. Self-righteousness separates because if we were connected, we might have to share our righteousness or worthiness with others. Turning a blind eye to another group's oppression or experience of violence is our own self-protection. Refusing to acknowledge the historical trauma of those around us is a cultural tradition many of us have been handed down generation to generation, forming our foundation of erasing wrongs so we don't have to right them. But we can change these traditions and narratives. The world can change because we can change. I have so much hope for you and I have so much hope for me. I'm fighting for your freedom and my freedom. We must have brave conversations. We must find out what we don't know. Waging peace requires that we have the courage to face what's broken, first in ourselves and then in the systems affecting those around us, and uncover who has been harmed and how we are connected to them. Because we are intertwined together. Love speaks the truth of the harm done, while unshakable goodness holds space for the offender at the table. We all have a seat at the peacemaking table. Love is refusing to take away an oppressor's chair at the family's table while taking the stick of violence out of their hand because violence ricochets and is absorbed by the most vulnerable and marginalized among us. It's time to center their pain and to put ourselves between them and the violence. Now, I don't know what your journey of peacemaking will look like, but for me, I'm never gonna stop learning and restoring as well as listening to and standing with those in pain. I am part of why another person is in pain, which means I can also be part of another person's peace. I'm complicit in parts of my own pain, which means I can be part of rebuilding my own peace. That is the wild hope that catches my eye and makes my heart beat fast. I'll never stop acknowledging the pain of others because empathy is the flashlight leading us towards wholeness and healing. And if we ignore those in our world and our neighborhoods who are in pain, we will ignore our own healing and suffocate our own hope because we are connected to each other. Waging peace is believing that the best for another person is the best for myself and my country and our world. You can build something new, one person, one relationship, one meal at a time. You can build friendships instead of watering the flowers next to our long held fences. You can choose to believe in the unshakable goodness of those across the pew, or the divides. You can choose fierce kindness by speaking the truth to people about the impact their decisions make on the vulnerable. We can call self-supremacy the liar that it is. It's a bait and switch, putting ourselves first, our kids first, our faith first, or, or our country first only creates us versus them dividing lines. It may even draw battle lines. It sells us the snake oil of scarcity. It will never give us the country, the neighborhood, or the world we want for our children. Only love can do that. Run towards your life as if, run towards love as if your life depends on it, because it does. Thank you. For anyone who doesn't know, I met Diana at a Red Letter Christians retreat. And um, Diana, your love just flows. So if you could start, and I know we all want to hear um, about that moment when you put down your guns and conscientiously object, but if you could start a bit with how you ended up uh, holding a gun, you know, a bit of your background and how you, how you ended up um, in Iraq. Yeah. So I grew up in a small little town in Minnesota. If anybody is old enough to know who Judy Garland is, Raise your hand in solidarity. Uh, Judy Garland. Uh, she was born in my hometown. That's like our only claim to fame. So I grew up in a small rural town of 8,000 people. And I was raised by people who loved God, loved their country, 
and love their guns. Um, and I think that was just kind of what I knew. So a little country Baptist church and my mom had served in the military. My dad had been drafted during Vietnam. Uncles, both grandparents. I mean, our family tree kind of looked like a uh, American flagpole. So this is like the most normal thing in the world. So when I wanted to go to college, I signed up to go in the military to um, because I knew more people who enlisted in the military than I knew who had ever gone to college. And I also think there's a lot of people who culturally it is more accepted to be patriotic than it is to admit that you are poor and the military is really your best option um, after high school. So that was a little bit of how I, how I came to sign up, but I did have a VW bug in high school. So I feel like somebody <laughs> should have told me and said, Diana, I don't know. This is a great fit for you. Um, so I had signed up and I had uh, gone to college to be a nurse. I had just graduated. I was basically done with my six-year enlistment when 9-11 happened. And I knew when that happened, um, my life was going to change. So anybody in the military just had this like feeling that their life was going to change. And it did. So um, on Valentine's Day, I got called up. Um, to be deployed, I got told that I would need to report in 30 days and I needed to write my will, put everything I owned in storage, and then um, have somebody else be on my bank accounts because they couldn't tell me where I was going and they could not tell me when I'd be back. Um, and that was when I was 23, which back then I was like totally an adult. But now I'm like, what a baby, <laughs> like what a total baby. <laughs> Um, I really had been handed a lot of beliefs by people that I loved, but I had never tested them. And I had never been up close to what it would look like um, until I found myself um, in the middle of the preemptive strike in Iraq. And it was the first night we were there and our we were going to convoy and drive into enemy territory the next morning. And the sergeant had um, was giving us our like safety briefing. And at the very tail end of it, he added, he was like, there is an enemy tactic of pushing little Iraqi kids in front of American trucks so that you slow the truck and then the soldiers at the rear of the convoy will be sitting ducks because they can't go forward and they can't go back and they'll ambush them. He said, I hope you understand your duty to keep your convoy rolling at all costs tomorrow. And if you're not able to do your duty, stand up now and identify yourself. And before I really could like figure out like, what was I going to do? Like, I believe that soldiers um, did hard things. I had been taught that it was okay to like take a life to save a life. And if I was doing it in the military, I ultimately was um, doing it on behalf of God and my country and all these things. But in the moment, I knew this just wasn't something that uh, was possible but before I, I knew if I was gonna like be a coward and stand up and say what well, I wasn't gonna do it uh, the sergeant just yelled dismissed and then everybody broke and went back to their tents but we were leaving at 4 a.m the next morning and so I had eight hours in a dusty hot tent in the desert um to pray my most pathetic prayer of oh god oh god help because I knew what I had to do, but I also knew that there was something bigger pushing back on that, that I, um, even though it went along with my beliefs and went along with everything that I've been told was okay, there was this other part of me that just was wrestling. And I don't know how it is for you. I don't know what people, some people call it the Holy Spirit. Some people call it the hint of heaven. I don't know. But in the middle of that tent at like my little, uh, saddest moment, um, I remember just hearing this like kind of like voice or these words kind of just echo back at me that's just said, I love them, Diana. I love them too. And in a minute, all the tension just broke. All of a sudden I could breathe again. And I just knew it was just the truest true. Um, I knew that, uh, that God loves everybody. And I knew that God loved me and God loved the person at the other end of my truck or my weapon. And it just felt right. And so I really didn't know what I was, what was going to happen the next day, whether I would have to make a choice. Um, but I just knew at that moment that 
I was never going to take a life. And it was the first time that I ever felt this freedom truly that I'd never tasted before. Um, and so I took the bullets out of my gun and had to figure out how to be a U.S. soldier. I was a combat medic, so it wasn't my primary job. Um, but I did, I was required to carry a weapon. And, um, so I had to figure out how I was going to be in war for another 397 days, um, refusing to load bullets in my weapon and knew that I wasn't ever, I would step in front of a bullet for anybody, but I was just never going to take a life anymore. So I, there's this like quote from Richard Rohr that says like, we don't think our, we don't think ourselves in a new way of living. We actually live ourselves a new way of thinking. And it was totally the case, like the most like not convenient time to have this <laughs> come together <laughs> for me. Um, but it's true. So I really didn't know how to be a peacemaker, but I just showed up every day and it really did change my life and changed um, everything. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me at the worst time. So before we get into that morning after, right? After you had that awakening, I, I just want to notice, and as your dear friend, as well, um, your language where you said, stand up and be a coward. And you said, um, uh, you know, pathetic cry. And that's that flipping, right? Because as that single only person that's like, hey, I'm not okay with this, that's not that's terrifying, right? And, you know, I think of like school children and that one kid that's like singled out that, you know, and- um, And being the only woman, and this is like, uh, well, you know, 20 plus years ago, um, the military is a very violent, dangerous place just to exist in it and has nothing to do with the enemies. <laughs> like it is a very dangerous well, place. Like you're saying, that that's considered cowardly, right? It's that kind of upside down, whereas, you know, that's the culture, right? You're in a culture where that's the coward. And, and what does it look like to turn that upside down? And- uh, find that bravery right because right when nobody thinks it's brave <laughs> like you're just a traitor you're just a total traitor <laughs> so so what did that next morning look like well um I woke up and I just knew I just knew that I knew that between me God whatever like I would I would never take a life. And so I got up the next day and um, luckily I got called to be an assistant driver and not the primary driver. And this is all just random. So you're just standing in line and they're calling drivers and all of a sudden they called my name, oh, strike, a driver of truck B. And I was like, oh, you know, because I knew that I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to make, I wouldn't drive over anybody that day. And um, and no child was pushed in front of our convoy that day, but kids ran along the road, the little dusty road. And I remember there are these two little girls who came running up towards our truck. And you know how little girls, their hair is like in the wind and they're a little scrubby, but just like blazingly beautiful, you know, with those mischievous eyes. And I took a picture of these two girls who ran towards my truck that day. And I forever um, remembered them as like, this is the person. This could have been a, a, a child who was going to be used by somebody else. And violence could easily have been taken their lives. And so it just reminds me again that violence is always our only enemy. And when we disarm ourselves of that, that is how we stay human. That's how we stay um, on the side of ourselves and not separate ourselves from humanity. We don't separate ourselves from the goodness of the love that connects us or God. And I truly think um, sanity wise, there were multiple things that happened in the war that um, I think that if they had happened, I would never have been okay. And so I feel like there's always been this gift of uh, something that I didn't even know was at stake. Like if I did certain things, it would be worse um, than if I was, had lost my life and so I feel so grateful to be fully alive today in my head and in my body and my heart and I have two little kids that I'm not um 
I'm not heartbroken to tell the truth to about my time in war. So there's so many places that I think violence could have taken those little girls' lives. It could have taken part of my soul. It always asks us to give too much. And it's ne- it's always too costly, no matter what, what the alternative is. Yeah. So what... Um... What was, what, how did you spend your time? And, and was there a specific period? And I confess I haven't, to, to folks, I haven't read the book yet. So I'm not just, um, uh, but also don't give anything totally away from the book either. Cause Ooh, yeah, that's right. Mean, that's good there. The audience. Yes. <laughs> but um, you want to give us while keeping the suspense, a little bit of uh, overview or maybe just a, a snippet picture. And we get to imagine the suspense of some of your time. Um, well, I will say that uh, most of the time authors never get what they want, and I did not get the cover I wanted, but there is about three pages of photos in here, and it's there's a photo of the two little girls that I told you about, and there's also a photo of um, like three significant paradigm shifters and the person because I had come, I had been raised up in a pretty, um, pretty fundamentalist Baptist little church. So the fact that a woman who was brown and Middle Eastern and Muslim was the person who reached out to me and really um, showed me what like preemptive love was, what waging peace really was. Like I was, she was everything I was told to view as very suspicious. And like nothing good can come from the Middle East or from the Muslim faith. Um, and so I love that so the people in my story were always people that I had been raised to see as my enemy. And yet they were the ones who um, reached out towards me and actually like in, in literal and spiritual ways saved my life. So there's a woman named Om Hassan. And you'll see her picture here. She is a Nareki uh, grandma, and that's her grandson. Um, but so when I laid down my weapon and took the bullets out, I knew what I wasn't going to do. But really, I didn't know what to do. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, this is a war zone and there's a lot going on and I have no control over any of it. But when I was walking through a village, um, Om Hassan had done the universal <laughs> hand wave um and I was like oh my gosh like she is head to toe black and wearing the modesty cloth like we're never supposed to go anywhere by ourselves and I had somehow gotten separated from my fellow soldiers um and I knew I should not go into her house and I didn't know why she was inviting me in um but it was one of those lightning strike moments where you know your life is going to change and you just got to make a choice and so I did I went I walked walked through a doorway, went into her house and she hugged me and we ended up um, becoming friends uh, for most of my deployment. And she's the one who showed me what it looked like to choose to love everybody on the battlefield, not just her side. Like she cared for me like I mattered as much as her daughters and grandkids. And that's when I learned what waging peace was. I knew I'd been taught how to wage war. It's pretty simple, 12 weeks. The army is very good at teaching people how to wage war. Um, but waging peace was was this different thing where she showed me how I could show up for everybody on the battlefield. And that's how I wanted to stay alive. And that's actually like this, this vibrancy about her that I'd never really seen. And like, we didn't have a ton of language going on. I had a very little Arabic. She had a little bit of English. But we, um, she changed my life forever, like. I always say, like, if there's one person on the planet that I would love to say thank you and to see today, like, it would be her. Because I know she's the reason that my kids have, like, a fully alive mom who's not just kind of, like, broken up with some bitterness and regret. And I don't know if she's alive today, but she's the one I would love to thank. Um, And then there's also quite a few different moments with different people that showed me these things that I could never have seen on my own. That is the reason why I wage peace today. I'm like, I have, I didn't even know I could be invited into living this way or connecting with people this way. And it's really been like the joy of my life. Um, And also there's a picture of her grandkid in here. 
And we have a bit of a adventure with that one, uh, getting her grandson through all the checkpoints because nobody cared and nobody wanted to give a little Iraqi baby medical care. Um, but we did make it through. So we have, there's quite a few things in there that I've had people read my book who were from every different faith, from pastors to politicians, to Muslims, to Christians, um, to people who are humanists and nobody feels like they're kind of the butt of the joke or the cautionary tale, like, oh, don't be like that person. Um, And so if anything, I'm that person in the book. So I feel like if people can be like, I can't believe Diana did that or thought that, then it gives us a way to um, kind of examine the things that we've been handed and ways that we have um, just not believed there was good or possibility in somebody else. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that in there, but I feel like most people read it in three days because it really is just some pretty compelling stories and you want to find out what happens next. Um, but it did uh, it did change my life. And that was really the reason why I wanted to um, keep telling the story and keep inviting people. And, I, and it came out right when uh, 2016, when uh, people, when the election happened, so people were more worried about that, but I've had more people read it today and then say, um, this is what we need today. Because oddly, I feel like there's even more <laughs> violence and hate now than a couple years ago, which shouldn't, I, that that kind of, that that didn't make sense to me, but, um, but it continues. So it's kind of an evergreen thing that people continue to find their next step, whatever that is for them that gives them hope and that they want to move towards people they've been told not to. So as I'm gonna, we're gonna keep it suspenseful and I know Susan has put in the chat for folks where to order the book, so please do so. Um, and I see we have a question already. And so we're gonna, this is from Susan, we're gonna pop into that. And then I'm actually gonna move somewhat into more today, like beyond the book, um, because like you said, in many ways, it feels more dangerous, right, today. But I'm going to start with Susan, who asked if you can speak about radical hospitality, um, the what the Iraqi woman offered you, and despite you being part of a hostile military invasion and occupation. Yeah, so I know you guys are seeing a middle-aged woman here. But when I was in my battle rattle, you um, looked gorgeous. <laughs> it's, I, I still remember thinking like, she should not invite me into her home. Like I'm an invader. I have a, I have a nine millimeter Beretta. Plus I have like, you know, stuff all on me to save lives. Like I, she had no idea if I would break her world in half but she chose me anyways. And I think that radical hospitality where she invited me in and truthfully, when you're in, when you're an invader in a country and we were the superpower there, we can do whatever we wanted. And there was like not much oversight. <laughs> and so um, I could have invited anybody else and wanted into her home and taken anything or done anything. So the fact that she invited me in, uh, I will never know why, but her hospitality, she invited me in, she hugged me, and then her family, uh, she was kind of like the matriarch of this little dusty village, because everybody she introduced me to, she was related to somehow. So she, we would sit down on this big bright rag, and if anybody has read like Old Testament stuff, Torah, or like, there's always these biblical scenes where people are all on a rug, and there's a bunch of pillows and people, and it was totally out of that. and. One time we had come back um, with her grandson and everybody was celebrating because he was alive. And I sat down and everyone tried to do tea, but she wouldn't let anybody talk about things until she had like served tea to everybody. And then the little girls came by and sprayed perfume in my hair and they were putting these rings on my fingers. And so I'm like, this radical hospitality isn't just like we will invite you in as a guest or will tolerate you. Um, but like she, I was one of her family members um, and she would invite me in the celebrations. Um, her 
husband had, he had been tortured during the Iran Iraq war and he had come back. And I remember her like so excited telling me, she's like, my husband's back, my husband's back. And then she brought him in and she was like introducing me so proud. And then she was like, can you help him? And then she put my hands on his ears, but there were no ears. Like I was just touching the like scars where his ears had been cut off and then his tongue had been cut out. And I remember thinking like, I am not going to cry. Like I am not going to cry because she is so happy right now that he's here. And she thinks, you know, she's inviting me to celebrate him and even see if I can help with my medic bag. Um, because torture is part of what the military does. Um, they're not supposed to, but it is definitely the mindset. And so this is the first time I'd ever met somebody who was on the other end of torture. Um, so I think that radical hospitality where she chose me and she chose my well-being in addition to hers, um, I think that's what really changed my worldview forever, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, even if I lost, even if I invited something off of radical hospitality and they stabbed me in the back or did something like I still saw that she had more freedom than anybody else I'd ever met. And, and if I was going to live a week or a bunch of years short or long, like I still wanted to live like her with that radical hospitality. So let's fast forward to being a, a parent and a mom and how as your kids got old enough to to grapple with this how have you raised them within it and at the same time um, navigated uh, your family and them their their larger family Sure. So if anybody has boys, you know, it takes them about 0.2 seconds to get interested in guns, play guns. <laughs> so by two years old, when you're potty training, they're like all about the guns. And so I remember this, this part where I could talk about the war with them in a way that I couldn't talk to anybody else about it. Um, but I wanted for them, like, I wanted to be truthful with them but I also wanted them to know their power to do good in this big wild world. And so I remember um, telling them, I said, cause you know, like kids have these, whatever game you want to play, whether it's good guys, bad guys, all the variations of that, depending on your era, uh, they were playing these games. And I remember telling them like, no, nope, you cannot point. You cannot, like point this fake gun at your brother and he's like why mom I'm like well because guns are made to kill people so if you ever point it at something or an animal you have to be okay with that thing dying and he's like oh so well what am I going to do with them I'm like you can tag him and put him in a fake jail but no you will not kill him <laughs> and I remember it's just this mind shift that says like if we believe that God made people and God loves people and we're connected, then we will never kill somebody. Like let God go with God. But as human beings in our humanity, sure, we will put people in jail, put them in a timeout, but in to honor God and to the sanctity of each other, we would just never believe that we could or should take a life. And so I remember raising them that way, but the hardest thing I ever told them uh was I was like I remember they were little and I was like you guys there's no such thing as a good guy and a bad guy because kids love that they're like that guy's bad at school or this is the bad guy and I'm like oh as much as I want to agree <laughs> I'm like it's I'm like I'm like it's not true I'm like there's no such thing as a good guy and a bad guy I'm like Bridger Salam I'm like look show me your hands and they'd show me their little hands and I was like, you have the power in your hands to break someone's world in half. Or you have the choice to build their world up. I'm like, but every single day, you have to make that choice. And it doesn't mean you're a good guy or a bad guy. It means that you have to make that choice. You get to make that choice. 
Um, and I feel like that was like the hardest thing I ever told them was that they weren't good guys. Like they would always have to make a choice. And some days they would make a choice that hurt somebody or harm somebody. But I knew looking at these little boy eyes that they were going to be 16 year olds. They're going to be 18 year olds. They're going to be 25 year olds. And this mentality that said that they could harm another person, it's, it would start small, but it could get really big. And I knew that the best thing I could ever do was to tell them that the hardest but the freest thing they'll ever do is to claim their right not to harm another person, even when somebody does something back to them. I'm like, the strongest person on the battlefield was not the one with a gun. Doggone everybody does it. That is not heroic or interesting. I'm like, but the person who can be themselves, even when bad things are done to them, like, you will never lose if you choose that. Like, you will never lose. And I always wanted them to know their power to show up when there's dark and scary things to bring to like to do good. I'm like, you have so much power and our community needs you. You're an essential part of our community. So they've been going to marches and they've been going to community events since they were preschool. You just bring the graham crackers and juice boxes. But and I remember taking them to one after a shooting and thinking, oh, man, I might be really messing them up. <laughs> like, what if they're scared? And I remember asking them, you know, from their car seats in the back, I'm like, hey, you know, what are you thinking? Are you, were you scared today? And I remember one of them said, no, no, mom. She, he's like, because I know if something bad happens to me, then everybody will show up for me and they'll light the candles. So I was like, oh, so like, Yes, they were violent things, shootings that we were coming, but they also saw that people always came and we always lit candles and somebody always sang this little light of mine. <laughs> no matter what house of worship we were in, uh, somebody would sing this. And so I think raising my kids uh, to choose and to acknowledge and be responsible for their choice to build someone or break someone down, word or deed, I feel like that has been the most, um, I think it's generationally life-changing, but it's also been the hardest uh, for them. Because my oldest son, he's 16, he told me that he told somebody at a class, a teacher asked him, and he's like, something that shaped him or is significant. And he's like, well, I was raised in an aggressively nonviolent household. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that stings, but true. <laughs> true you know it's it's disruptive it didn't and many couldn't watch certain movies and wasn't going to get certain things and doesn't play certain video games like I saw violence as something to protect him from um and sometimes it sucks for him but I know that he knows um why yeah so what inspired you to write the book and what were your and are your aims for it? So I was working for a group that was unmaking violence in Iraq. Um, and that was really important to me as a veteran. I really wanted to unmake the violence in the place that I had done violence. And, but every time I would get up, I would end up telling my story. <laughs> I would end up telling my story again and again. Um, and so I was like, you know, I think <laughs> books are how uh, people tell the story. But also my husband, um, he had told me, he was like, Diana, you have to write down like why we are who we are, like how we became these like total weirdos with nonviolence who are very different than our extended family, very different than what we should be. Um, he was like, I don't care if you write it and shove it under our bed. I'm like, but our kids need to know like how we became us and why. Um, so two for my kids, because if I ever died, I want them to know. <laughs> um, and I don't take anything for granted. So, you know, I'm a nurse too. I think like death happens. Um, so one was so that my kids would always know their their story of the origin, how they became who we are. And also because I wanted to invite regular people um, 
I think we need better invitations. And I didn't get an invitation to see people differently or to wage peace until I was in the middle of a battlefield. And I really think it's disrespectful to kids that they never get to have this conversation, not some, but many never get to have these ideas offered to them or invited, depending whatever group you grow up with, you mostly only hear one way to see the world. And so I wanna invite people to wage peace. And that means that we um, commit acts of courage right where we live to activate justice and to instigate joy. So um, I think that that's just the way that no matter where we are, if we show up for our neighbors and we show up when violence happens, that we are waging peace. We're creating new things where we live and it doesn't have to be on a stage and it doesn't have to be you don't have to leave any of your old beliefs behind or demonize anything, but you can add choosing to love people who you've been told just to not trust or not to notice or that they're their, they have problems, it's their own problem. Um, I feel like it's really how we become more alive and it's been the best thing that I've ever done. So I just wanna, the Waging Peace Project is kind of like the eighth grade science project where you do it all together and it's the most fun thing you've ever done. Um, so I'm just inviting people to do it where they live and to connect with other people. And if you sign up for our newsletter, I just send out practical tips, things that are going on and invitations because I love being invited. Um, and I think other people do too. And right now, I think we need more invitations right now because the camps are super loud. And if we don't start to connect with people, they can't feel loved and they can never be invited into a better story than they are. Um, yeah. So that's kind of my intention. So you answered one of the questions that was coming up in the chat, which was, what's the difference between not killing and active nonviolence? And, and what is like, can you define waging peace? And so, and I just loved that. And uh, I wanna encourage folks because we have your website in the chat to go ahead and sign up for the newsletter as well as buying the book um, because I'm declining. One of the questions was about the consequences of uh, putting down your gun, but I'm gonna let folks read that in the book. So I wanna ask, um, and, and this was a question from the chat, like how both at the time and then currently your relationship with um, folks still serving in the military yeah, so, and also that's like basically my extended family. So it's tricky and <laughs> there's tension because we have these zero sums. So when I first started talking about waging peace, um, I've written quite a few things on Veterans Day and for veterans. And I'm like, let's wage peace like veterans' lives depend on it because they do. Like, you know, like war and these things should be the last resort. And we're kind of spending our veterans' lives cheap. Like the U.S. military, it has boots on the ground in 80% of the countries on the planet today. And I think that is harmful to soldiers, unnecessary, and the cost is really high. Um, so when I first started talking about peace, my uncle told me, you know, that he thought I was being very disrespectful to those who have served. And so I think that there's just holding the two things that say that there are individuals who have done things, good and bad. And we can respect that. But my conscience requires me to speak out for peace because the military in America believes that if we want peace, we have to start a war to achieve peace. But the real question is, what if we started with what we want at the end and made the means be the end. So we bake the peacemaking into our conflict because that's what we most want. And then in our conflicts, we practice peace because that's what we most want. And so I think it's just being able to hold two things. So one, to answer the question, tension. Two, there's also a lot of soldiers that when I speak in a lot of churches that have a very nationalistic, patriotic narrative that you cannot push back against, I have soldiers come up to me all the time and say something along the lines of, I had the same experience too, where they were like actively serving or 
a war and they just all of a sudden had this conscience where they're like, oh, this is not loving my enemies. <laughs> and so they tell me that they've had these same experiences and they're like, oh, I just know I had to get out as soon as I could, but they do not feel free to share them with their families or their faith communities because they do not feel like they can. Like they're not free, even as a veteran, they're not free to say, I believe in peace. What, um, what gives you that, and this might be a hard question, but um, what gives you that, that you're just one of the most courageous people I know and you're so outward, you know, with it and giving of it. What gives you that, um, that courage? Well, people have read the book and they have used the word courage a few times and no humble brag here, but I'm like, I don't really get it. I don't see it. <laughs> I do see uh, necessity and survival. And because I was trained as a combat medic, it's always like, how do you keep somebody alive? You know, airway, breathing, circulation, like you got to do the first thing first. And for me, I think because uh, waging peace and choosing to lay down my weapon and actually move towards people that felt like oxygen in a place that was like slowly killing me. I feel like it became a survival for me. And then it became like joy to me. And so I think the reason that I can't not talk about it is because it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I truly, truly believe that it's the best thing that's going to happen to the next person when they start to feel free enough to love instead of hate and to make room for more people at the table. I think that we're made for it. I think that's actually, if we, if we strip down the loyalties that tell us, if you, if you like them, then we won't like you, you know, um, if we truly all felt safe enough, I think that love would rule the day. And I think it would, it would chart a new constellation for us. So I think the reason that I can't shut up about it is because it feels like oxygen to me and I don't want to live without it. Wow, that was inspirational. Um, I know we, we, you and I were together as, as well as many of FOR's team in Chicago recently for emergency summit to address the war in Gaza. And um, I was thinking as you were talking about this idea of, of enemies, right? And how we fear the unknown. And, and uh, it's the case that um, the whole of Israel is, I forget what it's, New Hampshire and something, it's really, really small. And yet Israelis, and other than serving in the military, live their entire time without going into the West Bank, certainly not Gaza and not meeting a Palestinian. So the idea of a Palestinian is like, and certainly, especially those in Gaza, and yet um, it's a country with conscription. And there, so there are 18 year olds just going off and in. And um, if you could talk to them, what uh, would you to 18 year old Israelis being conscripted? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would also say, in, in some ways, that's talking to my 18 year old self. Um, absolutely absolutely if I, could, if I could tell them anything I would just tell them that they are made for more and their life is so much more beautiful and valuable to not allow it to get spent cheap or dinged up or robbed because there are things that you feel like you have you're being told you have to do um but you will pay the price forever for that and so I think if I could tell every 18 year old, I would just say like you have, there is a thing that we need you to do and violence will only um, take you away from that and, and take things from you. Um, but just to choose to believe they're worth more than being a soldier in somebody else's war. Um, because I think if someone would have looked me in the face and said, Diana, you are made for love and not death. And you can be part of the kingdom of life where we're always, wherever we're going to be, we're going to be growing life. And we're going to be championing life, or we will be getting used to deal death out to our neighbors, um, near and far in all different ways. Um, yeah, I would tell them to guard their life 
and to celebrate it and not to let it be used cheap. So I want to go back to the beginning of your story in a sense. And um, I'm one of those people and I don't know how many on this call or not on this on this webinar uh, that grew up, you know, on the coastal city and progressive college towns and uh, very distanced from what yeah, you... Yeah, we don't know you, Ariel. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, when people would ask me, especially, you know, the U.S. doesn't have a draft, but you spoke about what we call the poverty draft. And if you could talk a bit more of what that's like and any ideas that or work that you're doing and encourage us to get involved in to um, to challenge that, right? Because we don't have that type of conscription. We have what you described. We have economical, like schools are being economically segregated today at a high rate. And I think we have economical, uh, we have an economics draft. And so what one there's called, it's called truth and recruiting. And it just tells kids because, um, kids in lower economic areas are being targeted by recruiters. And there's a reason for that. And so I think if you can, like, tomorrow, find an under-resourced school in your city and just volunteer once a month. Invest in these communities because kids need better options. And if they don't have adults telling them, you're really smart. I think you could be an artist. Guess what? I will help you fill out the form. You can go to college or you can find your next step without having to give away four years of your life and possibly your conscience or your soul. Um, the the data for veterans are they 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 have less health, kill themselves twice the rate. They also are less likely to hold a bachelor's degree. So all the stuff that you sign up at eighteen thinking is possible, um, typically, does not happen. And so I think if people could start to invest their talent and their time and their belief in a local school that is under-resourced, be the one adult who is interested, be the one adult who says, you got options. Let me tell you about this. Let me take you here. Let me show you this. Guess what? I'm an electrician. Um, just we need that investment because we have to give people a better option. And that is also a military tactic is that when you move in as an oppressor, uh, we had this thing called the civil affairs unit and we would go out and the whole idea was to win hearts and minds. We're like, we have to offer them something better to get their loyalty away from their old guy. And so I think like if we're going to disrupt this military pipeline that takes our kids and really does uh, use violence to brainwash them. I'm like, we have to give them a better option. And I think there should be better jobs. There should be better options uh, for kids that feel doable. And the number one thing that is doable is if an adult believes in them. So if you can just start to believe in kids and show up where they're at and offer a counter narrative, a better option than just the recruiter, um, do that. I think that that would have changed my mind if I had a single person who told me, Diana, there's more options. I think you drive a VW bug. You may not want to train to kill people. <laughs> I think that's how we do it. We have to invest in and give our neighbors something better um, than what the military is offering. So we're getting, we're getting at time and I'm going to ask you one more question and um, before I do that I'm just going to let folks know that remind folks that uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation we're working towards a summit on gun violence and Christian nationalism in the spring first uh, weekend in May and uh, Diana's one of the speakers we're inviting so read her book in advance and you can ask her in person a bunch of questions um, so my last question for you is what your faith looked like, you know, you said you grew up in a small Baptist church, what your faith looked like before going to Iraq and how your work waging peace um, affects your, your faith today. Yeah, I would say that I was raised to love God and convert people. <laughs> that was kind of the main job of Baptist was to get saved yourself and then to evangelize. Um, and so I think that my faith now, 
um, takes the same thing that was that I knew to be true, that God was love, and then really connects with the red letters. So the words that Jesus said is often written in red letters in the Bible. And all Jesus talked about was love and to prioritize uh, the poor, the widow, the incarcerated, and the immigrant. And all of those things are the things that I actually think make faith alive. And it actually connects us to like being neighbors. And I think it's like the place that we actually become more alive. So my faith is looks a lot more like that, um, showing up for people. And it also includes other folks because wherever you were born, you're pretty much born into a religion. And I think we're all in the family together. <laughs> it's just where you were born to who and to what continent and at what time. And so I was born into loving Jesus. And so like, I love Jesus. I think he's just like <laughs> the best. Um, but I have like Muslim friends and like, they super love Muhammad. And guess what? Like most everybody is telling the same things, which is to love God and to love your neighbor. And so I find a lot of joy in uh, connecting with other folks and doing it together, because I think it's it's the beautiful thing that I think we need to see more of. Thank you. So I'll see if you have any last words of um that you know, we've been putting your website in the chat, but if you wanna give folks uh, social media handles to follow, uh, other things to get involved in, I just wanna give you the, the last uh, word on that. And also I have saved the chat because it was just full of appreciation mm -hmm. um, and the like. So I, I've saved that to uh, share with you later, but yeah, yeah. please tell us uh, where else to follow you who else what else to plug into all yes. of that if i could ask everybody to do one thing for peace it would be to sign up to get our waging peace newsletter um, it might not mean a lot to you, but it's actually very helpful when it comes to publishing books. Um, it really opens doors. So even if you don't want to get a monthly email of hopeful stories and tools for peace, um, just delete it. But if you put your name on there, it is actually very, very valuable. <laughs> um, and it's the easiest way to find and be invited to certain things that you can do or actions. So sign up on the newsletter. And then the second thing is, um, I would say just buy the book because we vote with our dollars. And if the publishing industry can see that people actually want to read about soldiers who now wage peace or about um, faiths working together instead of apart, about building love instead of hate, they will allow the person behind me. Um, you know what? It is not available in paperback, but the hardback is so beautiful. You're just going to love it. Um, <laughs> But, but it'll pave the way to open it for the next person behind me. And so I think we do get to vote with our dollars. And also you can always have um, the Waging Peace Project come and talk to your church. We do book clubs. Um, we just did a community center around Martin Luther King Day. But I think often like we haven't even given peace a chance and it's easily taught. Like I got taught how to wage war easy peasy. Uh, I think we also... <laughs> can uh, be invited to wage peace pretty easy peasy and it always leaves people more hopeful and I feel like more than anything we need a little bit of um, optimism and a little bit of can-do hope right now because if not like despair is real um, and I I don't want I don't want to sink into that which is why I love to work with people like Ariel and four and red letter Christians and show up at my kids school I was just there this morning I think that um, waging peace means we really choose to take an action. So sign up for a newsletter. You can follow me on Instagram. That's the easiest way to find out what's currently going on. Um, but then also buy the book and buy it for somebody else. Um, it's, it's a very fun one to buy for people because, uh, it, it it's a feel good one, even and though I there's a lot just of things. It up an audio book, which is often, uh, how I read books. It's often while driving. So Yes, an audiobook. And just thank you for being part of Fellowship of Reconciliation. Fellowship has been so encouraging to me. Like it is another like, wow, I'm so glad <laughs> the legacy is here. I'm so glad I get to be part of it um, and keep doing good things. It is hopeful to me that uh, that it exists. You inspire me. So thank you everyone for joining and by the book.
get involved. And thank you, Diana. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here.